Okay, it's 11 o'clock and it looks like we're live. Perfect. All right, so welcome back to another Life Science Live on this Friday morning. I hope that you're all having a great uh, week so far and that you're looking forward to the weekend. I know I am. So for the past couple weeks in Life Science Live, we've been talking about some of the coldest places on Earth. We talked about the Arctic and the Antarctic, um, the North Pole and the South Pole. And today we're going to keep talking about the cold because it's still really cold. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk specifically about cold in Utah. And here in Utah, it does get pretty cold in the winter. Last night it was really windy at my house and my dog didn't want to go outside because it was so cold. <laughs> um, just because we're a desert doesn't mean that it doesn't get cold. And we definitely have seen that recently. This winter has been pretty mild, so we haven't had a lot of snow, at least not here in Provo, and not a lot of really cold days either, but there are some places in Utah that can get really, really cold. Um, there's a there's a sinkhole kind of near Logan, Utah called Peter Sinks, and that is actually one of the cold, it's been recorded having some of the coldest temperatures in the continental United States. So the way that the mountains are situated there, um, cold air can actually get trapped and the temperature in I think 1985 it dropped down to negative 69.3 degrees uh, so that was somewhere in Utah and that was the second coldest temperature recorded in the United the continental United States so super cold we have some cold in Utah but we also well well here in Provo even uh, we have like an average January high temperature of 40 degrees and then an average low temperature of around 22 degrees. So pretty cold, but it also can get pretty warm. Uh, in, in Provo again, in the summer, in July, the average high temperature gets up to around 94 degrees. So the animals that live here are different from, hey, welcome everybody who's jumping on. <laughs> the animals that live here are different from some of the ones that we've talked about that live in the Arctic and the Antarctic because there it stays pretty cool all year round. But here we have animals that have to be able to survive in the heat in the summer and then also in the cold in the winter. So I wish we could talk about all of them because there are so many amazing animals in Utah, but we're gonna focus on just a few specific ones and some of their different strategies for surviving in the winter. And the first one that we're gonna talk about is a rattlesnake. So this little guy right here is a western diamondback rattlesnake, which is kind of funny because it's actually not a Utah species. These are found farther south, like more in Arizona and uh, parts of Texas, not really up in Utah. But we do have seven different subspecies of rattlesnakes that live in Utah. I have a little picture here to show you real quick. This is a map of all the rattlesnake subspecies in the western United States. And you can see uh, Utah there. It's sort of a grainy picture, but pretty much all of Utah has um, rattlesnake, rattlesnake habitat. Rattlesnakes don't like to live way up high in the mountains. They won't go up to super high elevations, but if you're in a low enough elevation, there are probably certain species, subspecies of rattlesnakes that live in your part of Utah. Um, and like all reptiles, rattlesnakes are cold-blooded, or ectothermic is the word that we like to use, which means that they get their, temp their heat from the outside, so they don't make it themselves. Um, and because of that, they have to have some different ways to survive once the temperature drops really cold. Once it's that cold, it's hard for them to move around to find food. Welcome, Becky. <laughs> um, if you guys have any questions while I'm talking, feel free to throw something into the chat. I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, but yeah, so it's hard for these for these rattlesnakes to survive in the winter, so they've got to do some different things. And the biggest thing that rattlesnakes do is to perform brumation. So you've probably heard the word hibernation. We talk about hibernation a lot. With rattlesnakes it, and, and all reptiles, it gets the name brumation, which basically means hibernation, but with an ectothermic animal, with a cold-blooded animal. Um, during brumation, they're not exactly sleeping. It doesn't, they don't go to sleep for several months, but they do slow down all of their body processes. Everything their body's doing slows down a lot, and they just kind of sit there for a little while. Um, they don't eat food because, at least not very often, because it takes energy to go out and find that food. And the whole point of brumation is to just save your energy 
so that your body can keep itself alive until it warms up enough for you to go back out and, and hunt for more food and get more energy that way. So instead of going out to find the food, they just kind of sit around. Most of the time they find a den, someplace maybe in a crack in a rock or underground or even in your garage. <laughs> um, they'll go there, they'll wait out the winter. They often go in the fall, they'll go into their den and then they'll just stay there until about April in Utah. That's usually when the snakes in Utah start to come out. April, May, kind of late spring, early summer when it's nice and warm again. Um, sometimes, some subspecies of snakes, they'll, of rattlesnakes, they'll come out on like particularly warm days. I think we had a couple days this week that were pretty warm. Maybe not warm enough for rattlesnakes to come out, but if there's a really sunny, warm day and the rattlesnake feels like it can use that chance to go find a snack, it might come out of its come out of its den and do that. Um, but yeah, the actual time, the exact time that they come out definitely depends on the subspecies. And also the place they choose choose to den depends on the subspecies. So I mentioned some of them might live in your garage. Not all types of rattlesnakes might pick a garage. If you do find a rattlesnake in your garage while we're talking about it, it's actually probably good to just leave it alone. They, they are dangerous. They do have venomous bites. Actually, I can show you their little, you can see their fangs if I can get it to focus on him. <laughs> so you do want to keep your distance, but in the winter, they're very slow and very sluggish. And so the best thing to do would probably be to call like a professional wildlife removal service who can go relocate the snake somewhere a little safer or the Department of Wildlife Resources if it's going to be a problem. Um, other than that, if you see a snake sleeping in the wintertime somewhere, the best thing to do is just leave it alone and let it stay put, and it'll probably stay there for the whole winter. So, that's all I had for rattlesnakes. The next one we're going to talk about is actually an invertebrate, um, because bugs and, and other invertebrates have to do things during the winter too. So, I have a picture of a mountain snail. This is a type of snail you can find in Utah. There's a few different kinds of mountain snails. Um, but they're, they're small little snails. You can see the, the ruler there. And in the winter, just like snakes, mountain snails are ectothermic. So they, they can't make their own heat. So they've got to figure out ways to survive the winter too. And just like snakes, they go into a sort of hibernation. Um, I have a little snail shell here. This is not a mountain snail, but it is a, a similar little round snail. You can see they have the opening where the snail will come out and most of the time in the winter what they do is they'll pull into their shell and then they'll make a sort of mucus coating that covers that opening of their shell. Um, and so they'll go underground or into a crack in a rock pile or something like that and then that way they're like away from the elements they don't have to worry about getting too frozen. <laughs> um, and then they seal off that crack and they just wait out. Um, that little mucus coat is called an epiphram. I don't want to say it wrong. Um, so the, the epiphram will close them off and keep them nice and safe. And it also keeps the inside of their body from freezing. Um, if a snail was to completely freeze, it would die. And they have a lot of water in their bodies. They have to stay wet all the time because if they dry out, they'll die. So that epiphram kind of serves two purposes to keep everything inside from freezing and also keep everything inside from drying out. So if you find a snail, in especially in the winter time, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll kind of use that epiphram to seal themselves to a rock. So this is a picture of a, of a mountain snail that's attached itself to a rock. If you ever see that, you want to make sure you don't pull it off because if you do that, you can break their epiphram and it can kill the snail. So if you see a, a, a snail stuck to a rock, just Leave it alone, just like you want to leave the snakes alone. Okay, the next uh, animal that I have to talk about, I actually don't have one to hold, but it is right here behind me. So this is the June sucker, and we love to talk about the June sucker because it's a species that lives right here close to Provo, and that's the only place it lives. It lives in Utah Lake, can't be found anywhere else except for like the little tributary streams that feed into Utah Lake. Um, and it's a really neat and a threatened species. Um, there are a lot of projects going on to try to make sure that the habitat around Utah Lake and in Utah Lake is 
better for these dune suckers because they've been threatened by invasive species and um, we want to make sure we protect them. But surviving the winter, <laughs> I lost my train of thought there for a second. So most of the year, the dune sucker will kind of spread out throughout the entire Utah Lake. You can find it just everywhere. They're very mobile, they'll move around. But in the winter, all of the dune suckers move to the eastern portion of the lake. And scientists are pretty sure they think that the reason for that is that there are some warm freshwater springs that feed into the eastern part of the lake. And so the temperature over there is just a little bit warmer than the rest of the lake. And so in the winter, when, when the lake is cold, the fish move over there. And then just like both of the other animals we've talked about, dune suckers are also ectothermic. So having warmer water is probably uh, something that makes them a little bit happier because they can't make their own heat and warm themselves up when that water gets really cold. There are also some special properties of water itself that help the dune sucker to survive in the winter. Um, ice, when it forms on a lake, it covers just the top surface. All that ice will kind of float to the top. And so underneath, all of the fish still have water to move around in. Utah Lake isn't gonna freeze solid all the way to the bottom. So those fish are able to stay in the not frozen water and that layer of ice on the top helps to trap oxygen in the water so that they can still breathe. So they don't have to worry about suffocating. They also don't have to worry about getting frozen in solid ice. They just stay near the bottom of the lake where the water stays a little bit warmer and move to the east where those slightly warmer freshwater springs are coming in. Okay, and then our very last animal that I wanted to talk about is our first endotherm, which means an animal that does produce its own body heat, a warm-blooded, you might say. Um, and that's the mice in Utah. We have lots of different mouse species. This one here is a pinion mouse. It's kind of a, a sad looking one. He's been through a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a pinion mouse. I also have a picture of a deer mouse, which is a similar little guy, very cute. They also carry diseases, so you definitely don't want to go picking them up in the wild. But um, both kinds of these, both of these kinds of mice, and pretty much every type of mouse in Utah does not hibernate during the winter, which might be kind of surprising because a lot of rodents. These are these are rodents. We know that, um, and squirrels, which are also rodents, and other kinds of rodents. Lots of them will hibernate during the winter. Um, so just like we talked about with the snake, their body. Uh, function slow way down and they just kind of stay in one place but mice don't hibernate and they don't even really like store up extra fat to sustain them through the winter like uh, deer might eat a lot during during the fall and then that can kind of help them get through the cold weather when there's not as much food but mice don't do that what they do is just keep going living their lives so when there's lots of snow they might dig tunnels underneath the snow and these are called subnivian tunnels. They are a little bit warmer um, when you're in a place where the heat has been trapped, just kind of the same concept as igloos. They're able to trap heat on the inside, stay away from the wind, and move around underneath the snow there where it's a little bit warmer. They might store up some seeds and different things to sustain them through the winter, and they'll go to those different caches. They can remember where they've stored all of that food uh, but they'll also just keep looking for more seeds and fruits. Um, the pinion mouse, this little guy, he eats a lot of juniper berries in the winter. And that's because by the end of the fall, the juniper berries have sort of matured and some of them have fallen off or they might still be attached to the juniper trees. And the pinion mice are able to walk around and look for them and keep eating them. And they just do that throughout the winter. Um, oh, one thing that's interesting about mice though is that because they're so tiny they lose heat really really fast so we're we're big and we have a lot of um, volume on the inside of our body but a mouse is small and so they have a lot of surface area on the outside of their body and not as much volume in the middle so in order to stay warm they have to just keep eating because if they if they stop they'll lose that heat really fast um, so they eat lots of food, they keep looking for those seeds or juniper berries, depending on the species, and if they stop, they might die. Um, so some other ways to stay warm to maybe help reduce the amount of food they have to eat. 
they might huddle together in a group with lots of other mice. And that's pretty common for deer mice. You've probably, I, I know I have some friends who have found deer mice hiding out in their shed and there'll just be a big nest of them with lots of mice. But the reason they do that, part of the reason they do that anyway, is that they can huddle together and stay warm. They sort of trap their collective body heat in a little small space and it's a good way for them to conserve some of that energy so they don't have to eat quite so much. Another way that they are able to survive is by by shivering, which is something that we do, but mice are really good at shivering. <laughs> um, they are able to increase the number of red blood cells in their blood, which makes it so that they can get extra energy from their blood as like a little burst of extra energy. They can't just constantly do it, but if it's a really cold night, they might, um, they might get those extra blood cells and get that extra burst of energy and then just keep shivering all night long. And when you work it out, they save energy that way rather than using too much of it. And then sometimes if the temperature gets really, really low, they might go into torpor. So we talked about how brumation was like a special kind of ectotherm hibernation. Torpor is just a fancy word for like really short term slowing down your body temperatures and, and uh, functions. So for just a little bit, they'll slow everything down and go into like a sort of deep sleep and they don't do it for very long. It's not even usually a whole day, just like the coldest part of the day so that they're able to save that energy when it's too cold to get up and walk around. And then somehow the scientists don't even really know how they decide when to wake up, but at some point their torpor will end and they'll get up and then they'll go back to looking for food. And those are the only animals that I had to talk about today. Hopefully you learned some cool new stuff about surviving winter in Utah. Next week, we're actually gonna keep talking about Utah winters, but we're gonna talk about how plants survive. So if you have questions about that, start thinking about them now and you can ask me during our, our Life Science Live next week. And I'll see you then, bye.